All right, welcome to church, everybody. Welcome to church. Come on, let's clap and welcome everybody joining us online as we dismiss fifth and sixth grade. Keep clapping for them as they go. Love on them a little bit. Well, here we are, week five of the series called Around the Table, where we have been intentionally focusing internally, um, you know, different from setting the table, where, where we were really focused on just God's vision for um, our church and our lives uh, and how we live out the gospel. Um, but this, we're, we're looking internally in how we're living out the gospel as well. You know, how we see and live life around the table with one another, um, the ramifications of the gospel and how Jesus used the table to build relationships um, and ultimately to draw people to this life-giving, life-changing friendship as well as discipleship. Um, we've been working from two premises. Number one, seeking and saving is the mission of Jesus. And number two, um, eating and drinking was the methodology of Jesus. In fact, we've seen this over the past few weeks. I'll walk through it in a second. But we've seen that Jesus literally walked people in the kingdom one meal at a time, one festivity at a time, one celebration at a time, one party at a time, one wedding at a time. Um, week one, irresistible community. We looked at Acts chapter two, the formation of the New Testament church as we know it. And in that, we realized this call to a deep level of devotion to um, each other, especially, but also to the scripture, to the word of God, to prayer, to fellowship, to breaking bread, remembrance, um, which is why, honestly, you see some of that in our language, in our vision language. It's so important. That, that 242 verse um, in, in Acts is so profoundly important. So we looked at irresistible community. Week two, we looked at irresistible culture. We went to John 2, and we studied the first recorded miracle of Jesus at the wedding at Cana. Um, and in that, we saw this picture of the culture of the kingdom of God and how we are to embrace and embody that kingdom type of culture, that, that irresistible hospitality, if you will. Week three, we saw an irresistible call, Luke 19, where um, I'm trying to remember some of this at the same time, but we saw uh, where Jesus engaged that despised, broken sinner named Zacchaeus. Anybody remember Zacchaeus, right? And, and Jesus told Zacchaeus that he wanted to come to his house. I want to come to dinner with you, right? I, I laughingly call that dinner with a sinner, um, which basically if we have dinner with anybody, we have dinners with sinners. So, um, but this led to an irresistible call to forgiveness and freedom and friendship, which is available to each and every one of us. But also it's an invitation for us to reply to, um, to RSVP to, but it's also an invitation for us to offer to others. Last week, Pastor Aaron did such a great job, did he not? Let's give it up for him. He brought us a great message on irresistible company from the book of Luke. We looked at Mary and Martha, and we looked at just kind of the difference between them, one who would serve at the table, but one who just really desired to sit at the table. Um, and we saw in that that both are important, equally important, um, sitting at the feet of Jesus, but also serving. Both of those are necessary, highly valuable and necessary. Um, today, I want to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 26. So if you've got a Bible, would you please go there? Matthew 26. We're going to have scriptures on the screens for you. If you do not own a Bible, at the response tables up front and in the back at the information center, there is a physical copy of a Bible. We'd love to give that to you as a gift. I believe everyone needs a physical copy in this digital age. We need a physical copy of the Bible. So go to Matthew 26. We're going to see a beautiful picture of irresistible compassion. The irresistible compassion of Jesus. I believe that we, just as we've been talking about this in this around the table thing, that we are called to not only that irresistible um, community and culture and call and, and, and um, you know, company, but we're also called to live a life of irresistible compassion. Um, not long ago, I shared a variation of this story about Corey Ten Boom and her family. I don't know if you remember. But Cory Ten Boom and her family had resisted the Nazis by hiding Jews in their home. And tragically, they were ultimately discovered and sent to a concentration camp. Every single one of Cory's family died in that camp, especially her sister, which was notable to her. Um, everyone died in the family except for Cory Ten Boom. She barely survived until the end of the war, seared by this terrible trial by fire, Corey's faith in God also survived somehow. And she spent much of her time post-war traveling um, parts of Germany, elsewhere in Europe, to passionately share the gospel um, out of this great faith that she had in Christ. 
Now, there was an occasion in 1947 where she was speaking at a church in Munich, at this basement of this church in Munich, and um, she noticed this balding man, um, you know, in this gray overcoat in the back of the room. She had been speaking on God's complete and holistic forgiveness, basically the compassion of Jesus, offering just complete forgiveness. But as she's speaking and she makes eye contact with this figure, this person, she's literally just stunned. She's stunned. She stopped in her, in, in her tracks. Her heart froze within her because she recognized this man at the back of the room. Now, the memory of that face, his face, had been burned into her mind, but also into her nightmares because she had seen him many, many times before, both in person and, like I said, in her nightmares. Dressed in his blue Nazi uniform with that visor cap with those hate-filled eyes, she remembered him. He was the cruelest of all the guards at Ravensbrück camp where she was, where she had suffered, really, the most horrible indignities anyone could have imagined to suffer. It's also where her sister had died. Yet here's this man in the back of the room that she is preaching in. She's sharing the gospel. She's talking about forgiveness. And at the end of her talk, he comes down towards her. He, he, he puts his hand out to take her hand. And, and he says, thank you so much for your fine message. He said, how absolutely wonderful it is to know that all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. That is something that Corey had said in her message, that all of your sin could be thrown into the bottom of the sea. And so here's this man now. She's completely paralyzed. And he says, isn't it good to know that all of our sins can be thrown into the bottom of the sea? Reciting her very words. She had spoken so easily and so profoundly about the greatness of the gospel and the forgiveness of Jesus. But here now is this man standing in front of her whom she despised and who in her mind, in her heart, she was condemning with every fiber of her being. She couldn't take his hand. She couldn't find the strength to muster the energy to take his hand. He's standing there with his hand out before her. She could not extend forgiveness to this horrible Nazi oppressor. She realized the man didn't recognize her. I mean, how could he recognize her? She was one, prison, um, one prisoner amongst thousands that he had tortured. She's just standing there. He said, you mentioned Ravensbrook. Hand still out. <laughs> He said, I was a guard there. I'm so ashamed to admit it, but it's true. He said, since then, I've received the gift of Jesus, and now he's my Lord and my Savior. I've been, it's, it, he said, it's been so difficult for me to work through all of my past. It's so difficult for, for me to forgive myself of all the horrific, cruel things that I've done. But I know that Jesus died for me, and I know that God forgives me. He said, I know it. He said, and please, if you would, I would so appreciate it if you would. I would love to hear those very words from your lips as well. Hands still out. Corey records her response in her book. She said, I just stood there. I didn't know what to do. She said, I was frozen. I, she said, I, whose sins had been forgiven again and again and again and again and again. I just stood there and I could not forgive. I want you to think about that. That just... In your mind's eye, go there. What would you do in this moment? I know that you and I, we've not, we've not suffered a horrendic, you know, horrendous amount of, of pain and torture uh, in any way. We, we can't even compare to her, her story. But try to place yourself. What would you do? What would you do? I mean, could, could we have the capacity to forgive? Could we... I mean, if we were in her position, could we somehow muster up enough energy and compassion for this man that we would take him by the hand and offer him the grace and the gift of forgiveness? Could we do it? Dutch Catholic priest, professor, writer, and theologian, that is a long title there, Henry Nguyen said this. He said, compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us 
to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, and powerless with the powerless. Compassion means full immersion in the condition of being human, which is exactly what we see Jesus embody. The full immersion of the condition of being human, but with irresistible compassion and divine purpose. So look at Matthew 26. We open up, and we're going to start in verse 6. Pastor Aaron kind of teed this up a little bit last week. We actually talked about the beginning story right here in setting the table where um, the woman comes in to anoint the feet of Jesus. She's got this very expensive, extravagant perfume. Most likely, we believe this is Mary. Um, And and we see verse 6 where where she's doing this act, this, this act of sacrifice with this perfume to anoint Jesus. And let's pick up in verse 8, because we see his response to the activity here. The disciples, there's a lot of response going on, but the disciples in verse 8, they are indignant when they see this happen, and they say, what a waste that was. Look at 9. He says, it could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus replies this, why would you criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? So here's some perspective. And we said this during setting the table, but what some of the disciples, notably Judas, what some of the disciples considered a waste, Jesus considered worship. I mean, this prophetic act of sacrifice mattered to Jesus and it ministered to Jesus. Look at his response in 11. He says, you're going to always have the poor among you, but you'll not always have me. He says, she's poured out this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. That's why I say this, this prophetic act that she just did. Jesus goes on. He says, I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Now, this is important. Watch what happens next in 14. Then Judas goes to the leading priests and asks, hey, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? So they give him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, don't miss it, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, let me just say this. We we need to be on guard, and here's why. Because the spirit of Judas is alive and well today. There will always be a Judas in your camp looking for an opportunity to betray you. Some of you have felt betrayed. Some of you have been betrayed. Are you... Are you Does that resonate with you at all? Um, Or it could just be that the depth of idolatry in our own heart could very well cause us to do things that we can't even imagine we'd ever do to somebody else. Maybe we are the betrayer in some situations. Now, Scripture says in 16, from that time on, Judas began to look for opportunity of how and when he could betray Jesus. So let's keep going. Look at 17 and 18. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples come to Jesus and ask, hey, where do you want us to prepare prepare the Passover meal for you? Jesus says, as you go into the city, you're going to see a certain man. I want you to tell him that the teacher says, my time has come and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. I love how Jesus does this. It's so smooth and eloquent. He did it to Zacchaeus. Remember, hey, Zach, I need to come to your house. Right here, we see the same thing take place. Um, Tell the man that you see that my time's come and I'm going to come over with my dudes and we're going to have a meal at your, hey, cook some stuff. I might do that. I might call you one day and go, hey, I'm coming over. Cook something good. I'm bringing 12 people with, right? (laughs) So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it's evening, Jesus sits down with the 12 at the table. Now watch this. While they're eating, he says, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. Now, in my mind's eye, because I got some ADHD, y'all, and I feel like sometimes cartoons happen in my head in some ways. So I feel like this this could have been a moment where Jesus is like, so here's what's going down. One of y'all better not do it. I'm going to come across this table if you do. No, I I want to feel like, you know, that there's more to this, but I think that there was actually... A lot of compassion in this moment. A lot of heartbreak in this moment. Because Jesus knows. He knows. One of you will betray me. He knew. I find this absolutely fascinating and challenging at the same time. That Jesus knows. Now listen. I've been betrayed once or twice in my life. And I can tell you it never feels good. Um, You know. 
But, but moments where I've been betrayed, ch- ch- check this out. Like, I didn't see it coming, right? It took me off guard. It took me by surprise. I was completely blindsided, especially a couple times that it's happened. And, and I didn't see it coming. And if I'm being honest, man, in those moments, it's like the rug's pulled out from under me, and I'm stumbling around just trying to keep my step, trying to stay standing, especially at the hand of maybe who was betraying me at that time. It's tough. Especially when it comes from someone that you would never expect that it should ever come from. Someone close. Someone dear. Not just near. When it happens, man, it's tough. But listen, those moments, for me at least, as they've taken me by surprise, um, and then it le- listen, and then it leads me to have to do this work, right? And, and maybe you too, but I've got to figure out now, how do I get through this? How do I get through this scene? How do I forgive? How do I offer maybe the benefit of the doubt? How do I move on even? What do I do with this, right? So I cannot imagine that Jesus is sitting there knowing that it's coming, okay? He's knowing that it's coming, and he still chooses to do what we're about to see him do. This is why I say Jesus is the embodiment of irresistible compassion. Look at verse 22, actually 22 through 25. Here's what happens. The disciples are in distress. They're trying to figure out who is it that Jesus is talking about. And look at 25, because Judas has the audacity to say, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus says, you have said it. Yet even still, verse 26 happens. As they're eating, Jesus takes some bread and he blesses it. And he breaks it into pieces and gives it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And then he takes the cup of wine and he gives thanks to God for it. And he gives it to them. He gives it to them. And he says, each of you drink from it. This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. This passage right here, I hope we never get over this. In fact, you know what the word passion means? It's not the way we use it, right? Like, I am passionate about donuts. It's not that, right? There was a time in life that I, was, I really liked donuts, Or maybe the way some of you, like, I'm super passionate about golf. Here's the true story. I am bad at golf. If I'm trying to hit the ball that way, somehow it's going that way because I'll catch it on the back, right? It's embarrassing. It's terrible. Like, why would I spend so much money on a hobby that I hate? I am am passionate against golf, right? (laughs) But you know what passionate, passionate means suffering. That's what it means. There's a suffering in passion. And so I, I am literally praying passionately, are you with me, that we cannot get over this scene. Jesus knows betrayal's coming, yet he's still willing to give the bread. I I hope that we become so enraptured by this moment that we just read about, that our hearts are so gripped by the grace and the compassion of Jesus in this act of mercy. He is taking the bread, breaking it, saying, this is symbolizing my body that's about to be broken for you. He's taking the wine, giving thanks for it, saying this wine is symbolizing the blood that I am willingly and obediently and humbly about to spill out for you. All to confirm or to prove that he is making a way for the promise between God and us, this covenant. He says it's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. His blood will be poured out as this willing sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. I hope that wrecks us and we are overwhelmed with the humility and and just so much gratitude because of what Jesus just did in this moment. Listen, Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed, yet still he was willing to become the bread for the betrayer. He knew that he was going to be betrayed, but he was still betrayed, but he's willing to be the provision, regardless of the pain. For even Judas. So let's all see this truth this morning. Jesus knew betrayal. Listen, if you have ever, ever walked through betrayal, 
And I'm, I'm going to get to a point in just a second that, that, that I don't, man, I hope that it hits because it hit me. But if you've ever walked through betrayal, know this. Jesus knew it. He was well acquainted with the pain of betrayal. Whatever you have ever felt at the hand of a betrayer, um, Jesus knows. He knows it all too well. And even still, he was willing to offer the bread of life even to the betrayer. Even in a moment, listen, he could have had every right to complain, to be offended, and to even hold Judas in contempt. But he still chose compassion. He chose compassion. It doesn't end there. Look at 31. On the way, Jesus says, tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised from the dead, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declares, listen, Jesus, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And Jesus says, well, I tell you the truth, Pete. Listen, this very night before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny three times that you ever even knew me. No, Peter says. He insists, no way. Even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples chirp up to vow the same. So not only did Jesus understand betrayal, listen, he also knew abandonment. He also was fully acquainted with rejection. I mean, for any of us who have ever felt the pain of feeling abandoned, Jesus understands, he knows, yet even still, in a moment where he could have had every right to complain, find offense, or hold someone in contempt, he still chose compassion. With the freedom of so many being in his focus, he chooses forgiveness. Can I say something that I said a couple of years ago that I knew was a word from God? I knew because I, I was not smart enough to come up with this on my own. But I said it in a series a couple of years ago. I'm going to pull it back around, all right? And this is the statement. You ready? Our issue that we face in our culture and our society right now is this. We have a far greater addiction to offense than appreciation for grace. But Jesus, he gives us this amazing picture of irresistible compassion. And our story doesn't end there. 36 Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. It's one of my favorite parts of the Bible right here. He says, sit here while I go over there and pray. He takes Peter, James, and John. They became, um, and, and then Jesus becomes anguished and distressed. We see this. He tells them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Here's another way um, that we can see that Jesus has compassionately, I mean, he, he just identifies with us with so much compassion. Listen, he also knew anguish. He knew the weight of suffering. He understood grief intimately. Maybe you're walking through grief, anguish. You have a God who understands. So G listen, Jesus is praying with such passion and such fervency. Many theologians believe, it's been debated... That the weight of what God had called Jesus to carry was beginning to press in. So much so, he is praying with such intensity, such fervency, such passion that little, um, little uh, drops of blood are, are starting to come out of his, the pores of his forehead as he's praying. It's that intense. 39 says, he goes on a little further. He bows down his face to the ground, saying, my father, if it's possible, please let this cup of suffering be taken from me. But then he says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. See, no matter what Jesus had endured and is about to endure, he's still willing to do what God is asking of him to do. It's here, Jesus returns to pray, comes back, finds his disciples asleep, um, they're not keeping watch, so he goes a second time, comes back, the same thing. Third time, he comes back. Now we're at 45, and he says, um, hey, okay, guys, go ahead and sleep. Get your rest. But look, the time's come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He says, up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as, Judas, as Jesus said this, Judas arrives with this crowd of men carrying um, swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and the elders of the people. The traitor Judas had given them this prearranged signal. He said, you will know the one to arrest. He's the one that I'll kiss. I'll greet him with a kiss. So Judas comes straight up to Jesus. He says, greetings, rabbi. 
and he grabs him and gives him this kiss. I cannot imagine what Jesus must have felt in that very moment, okay? The weight of it all starting to crush in. The sin of creation beginning to to fall upon his body. The anguish, the hurt of denial, the the pain of betrayal, the the suffering, the rejection. But notice Jesus' response. This whole message, can I say this, really boils down to two words in this next verse. Verse 50. Notice the response of Jesus. When Judas comes and kisses him on the cheek, Jesus says, my friend, my friend, go ahead and do what you've come here for. Jesus says, my friend. No no, no matter what had been said in the past, no matter what had been done, no matter the callous nature of being betrayed with a kiss, Jesus still calls Judas friend. This is irresistible compassion. Listen, what about us? What about us? No matter the betrayal, no matter the rejection, no matter the anguish that some people have put you through, are we willing to walk with people the way Jesus did? I don't know who the hand of the betrayer in your life was. It could have been your grandparent. It could have been your mom. It could have been your dad. It could have been a a sibling. It could have been an aunt, an uncle. It could have been friendly fire. It could have been in the church. In fact, can I tell you, a lot of times it is. When we launched Declaration, I knew, man, because I was a wounded wounded one. I spent a lot of years licking my wounds, looking through the filter of my wounds. Can I say that? Living through the filter of my wounds, self-preserving. You know, I had the Rolodex of the people that don't get calls back from John anymore. You know what I'm saying? So when we launched the church, I knew God was doing something because I got stuck on freedom myself. And I was like, wait, why, why am I, what's going on with this? Why, why, why am I struggling with this idea of freedom? July 4th is one thing, right? Fireworks, barbecue, Wow, okay. No, I'm talking real freedom, spiritual freedom. Someone in the room just like, boy, this is real freedom. <laughs> Calm down, dude. I'm talking about spiritually alive, abundant freedom. And I was struggling. You know why? Because for 21 years, I had lived through the filter of my own rejection and pain. And I couldn't have irresistible compassion to forgive those that hurt me. We got whole movements right now called ex-evangelicals and nuns and all kind of stuff. You've got minor Christian used to be celebrities that have now come out saying that they've just abdicated their faith and they're walking away from it. That's interesting to me. But you know why? It's not because they got theologically smarter. It's because the hurt has mounted so high and it's so heavy that they don't know how else to compartmentalize it and they don't know how else to deal with it. So they just walk away. And so many people, that's why we say, oh, you know, many people are fans of Jesus, just not his fan base. There's a lot of you in the house that have been wounded by friendly fire in the church. And my question is this, can we have this type of irresistible compassion even for those brothers and sisters in the house that have wounded us? We all got crazy aunts and uncles in the fam. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe just chunk it to that, right? Oh, that's just, they're the crazy one. They got SAR, S-A-R, some ain't right, right? It's all right. It's all right. God love them. God love them. God love them. Bless them. Bless them. You know, my, my, my pastor growing up used to say, if you ever hear somebody say, oh, bless your heart, they're really saying, oh, you poor idiot, you know? It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. But what about us? Are we willing to walk with people? Are we willing to invite our Judas to the table and offer him bread and wine? It's tough, isn't it? But you know what? I finally decided I don't want to hold back the revival wind of God because I'm too busy holding on to my hurt, my offense. Jesus shows us this picture of beautiful, irresistible compassion. I'm wondering, are we willing to live that life? Are we willing to lay down our offense in order to give grace? Are we willing to forgive? I want to show you something that stuck out to me Um, as I was studying this passage 
Because remember, no matter the betrayal, no matter the anguish, no matter the abandonment, rejection, denial, none of it. Jesus, even with the knowledge that he had about those that, that he, had inve- he had invested everything into them. And here they're coming for him. How could they have the capacity to do that? But I want you to see just a few things that he said. Verse 29, mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now we skipped that little passage. It was during the bread and wine moment. But I want you to think of the the narrative here. I want you to know he knows betrayal's coming. He knows denial's coming. He knows that all the hell's about to break loose in the house. And he still offers the bread and the wine. And he says, I'm not going to drink this again until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom and my Father's table. He said something else too. And I did hit this one, 32. Remember, consider the story. Think about the narrative. What all is happening. And this is what he says. But after I've been raised from the dead, I'm going to go ahead of you to Galilee. I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to meet, listen. So even in the midst of so many painful things that would have absolutely destroyed anyone else. This is Jesus' heart. This is his mind. This is what's on his mind and his heart. People, he loves them. He loves them. No matter what they did to him, he loves them. He chose to see the best in them when they were giving them their worst. He loved them. He chose to willingly forgive them over and over and over again. He wanted to be with them. No matter what, he chose to forgive. No matter what, he was the embodiment of irresistible compassion. We, I believe, are called, just as we're called to live that irresistible community with that irresistible call in that irresistible culture. That irresistible company of Jesus. We're also called to irresistible compassion. Back to the story from the beginning as we close. Corey Ten Boom. Remember, I said she recorded her response in her book. So there she is. She stand, I mean, she's standing there. She's absolutely stunned. She cannot formulate speech. She's staring at the one who had tortured her and was possibly responsible even for the death of her sister. And she says, I just stood there. I couldn't sit. Me, the one who had been forgiven over and over and over and over again again and again and I could not forgive she said it could have it could have been many seconds that that we just stood there he he had his hand out toward me but to me she said it felt like hours as I wrestled with probably the most difficult thing that I was ever asked to do in the entirety of my life more difficult than the concentration camp itself hear him in the moment now I'm preaching the gospel of forgiveness and here's this man who has represented everything horrible in my life, asking me to forgive. She said, I had to do it. I knew I had to do it. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And I just stood there with nothing but coldness clutching my heart. That's what she said. Here, this is what happens. When we allow ourselves to live through our filters, when we allow ourselves to be dictated by our pain, and our hurt and our offense, eventually we just grow far more distant and colder and colder and colder until it's almost like we were dead inside. And it permeates into every relationship in our lives, our marriages, our friendships. And this is where she's at. She said, all I had was just this coldness clutching my heart. She says, somehow, woodenly, if you will, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. She said, the current started in my shoulder. It raced down my arm and it sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth began to seemingly flood my entire being, bringing tears to my eyes. And she said, I forgive you brother I completely completely forgive you with all my heart I forgive you she said for a long time we grasped each other's hands 
the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I had in that very moment. See, it's when we have tasted this irresistible compassion of Jesus and understand what he has saved us from. It's then that we can appreciate this compassion that Jesus gives us in such a way that our only option then becomes to offer that same irresistible compassion to others in need. We are called to live a life of irresistible compassion. Would you close your eyes with me? As we close the service this morning, I just wonder how many of you have hurt like that. Even some of the, I mean, I gave you minor moments of stories from my life that that I just, man, I was hurt by people. Because can I say hurt people hurt people? Hurt people, that's what they do. They, they, They tend to hurt people. And so can we get some perspective this moment? And and you know, in the first service, we sang an old song, How He Loves. There's a lyric in that song that that just talks about when we see the grace in his eyes. At that point, we don't have time to maintain regrets. See, when we look into the heart and the eyes of Jesus and see this irresistible compassion for us in spite of the frailty of our humanity, in spite of our propensity to sin and mess up, when we can see in the eyes of Jesus the compassion that he has for us, We have no time to maintain regret. We have no time to maintain offense. We have no time to judge where we have been judged. It doesn't matter the slander that came against us. It doesn't matter what they said about us on social media. It doesn't matter what my best friend did, what your mom did, what that person at church said. It doesn't matter called to this so this morning I'm going to invite our elder families and some prayer team just to make themselves available we're just going to sing one song just about the goodness of God just thank you Jesus for your compassion and I just wonder in his kindness maybe he's, he's bringing this cleansing forgiveness he's calling us to repentance he wants to just bring this forgiveness to us, this compassion. He wants, to, he wants to pour out that compassion on our lives. Fill us up with it so that it can spill over on the others. But we, might, we may have to let go of some hurt and open our hands and receive what he has. So, so I'm going to invite you. Um, the altar's open, prayer partners. We have response stations to the right and the left and the front and in the back. Um, We have Eucharist supplies there. If you'd like to come to the table with your family or some of the church family, please do that. Let's just respond to the Lord. And let's just take a minute and say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Thank you for welcoming me at your table regardless of how I've betrayed you, regardless of how I've denied you. Over and over again, you continually welcome me to your table. Now, Jesus, may I do the same. May I do the same. Would you stand to your feet as the team begins to sing? As the team begins to sing, you move as you feel led and respond to the Lord this morning before we go.